Hello, and welcome back to my channel. Today I am going to be discussing my plans for reading, writing, and channel content during June, and I am very sorry if the lighting is much poorer than usual today because the sky is very overcast and raining and thundering outside, so anyway, let's just get down with it. I'm going to be taking part in the Ancients Athon Readathon yearly event, which is hosted by Jennifer Brooks, Hufflepuff Discovery, and David Wiley. Now, I'm not going to be doing all the prompts, but I will be doing a very select few of them, and some of them do overlap with one another. And the group read is The Book of the City of Ladies by Christine de Pizan, which I've been wanting to read for probably over 20 years now since I first found out about it in my um, junior year of university when I was taking a medieval history course at UMass. It was a really good class. It was taught by a visiting Brit British professor from Harvard, so that was like really cool. I can say I was taught by a Harvard professor, even though I personally didn't go there. And so anyway, the works I will be reading are a work of poetry, a work over 300 pages, a work it's time to stop thinking about and start reading already, and a work that is religion or mythology based. And so on the top you see my prayer book, but in addition to prayers, it also has Pirke of Vote in it, which is a short six chapter book of the Mishnah, which is very popular for studying because it's so, you know, easy and simple to read. I mean, obviously you all ideally want to study like Talmud and Torah and Zohar whenever with a study partner and a teacher, not just like read it on your own, but this is one of the few things in like, you know, Jewish law and like theology, you can actually kind of understand on your own without like taking an in-depth class or having, you know, like five plus study partners. We used to call it the ding a ling a ling hotline when I still live back home in Albany, New York. It's traditional to study this book, Pirkei Avot, between on Pesach and Passover and Rosh Hashanah. Some people like stop studying it um, on Shavuot, the holiday, which is going to be starting tonight at sundown, but many people continue studying it through Rosh Hashanah. And anyway, we'd like, you know, go around the room during um, Sword Actually Sheet, the um, third meal of the day on Shabbos and say, oh, I like this Mishnah a lot, or this line or this word you know, really pops out to me. I, I really don't agree with this, or I don't like this, or I have a question about this, or I'm confused about this. And we, you know, all kind of like discuss it together. And it's been a long time since I've reread this in full instead of just, you know, like studying it piecemeal here and there, there. And so I'm really looking forward to it. These are really, you know, simple, easy to understand maxims. You've probably like heard some of them like over time. And there's like, for example, a really cool one about this dude, a rabbi who found a skull floating on the water and what that really meant for people. And they're like really short, but they kind of go a little bit longer as it goes on. And it famously begins, Moses received the Torah from Sinai and passed it on to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders of the prophets, and the prophets passed it on to the men of the great assembly. They, the men of the great assembly, said three things. Be deliberate in judgment, raise up many disciples, and make a fence around the Torah. There are just so many wonderful things throughout this book. It's like wonderful, timeless wisdom for people of any faith or even no faith, and I would highly recommend you guys um, check this out. And obviously you see the Aeneid, which I did read my um, senior year of high school when I was taking an AP English class. I really didn't like it, and I actually kind of DNF'd it. I like it read like I guess maybe halfway through or a little over halfway, I understood and read enough to pass the tests on it. But, you know, I started wanting to you know, like finish it already because it was coming close to the end of the year and we would have to turn in the books. And so I, you know, went back to reading it and it really began picking up for me once the war started. You know, I'm really kind of like those action packed stories. It kind of became like a so-called like, you know, man's man story. I'm, you know, really like tomboyish and gender defiant. So that really appealed to me. And maybe this translation, it's not the one we read by, um, Robert Fagels, this will help me to like it much more from the jump. I've, you know, dipped in and out of it over the last year or so, you know, getting quotes and ideas for other things I'm writing, particularly my alternative history about Dante and just other things I've needed to, like, you know, reference it for. And I've really, really liked what I've read so far, and I'm really hoping I will enjoy it very much when I, like, finally reread this book as an adult, and maybe I can do a full video on that. And so anyway, and I'm also planning to do um, a video about, it's based on two and actually to like like five or six, I believe, blog posts I wrote a few years ago. I'm um, comparing and contrasting um, Peter Kurth's book, um, Anastasia, The Riddle of Anna Anderson, and a book which like totally shattered my belief that this woman was a Grand Duchess, The Resurrection of the Romanovs by Greg P King and Penny Wilson, who have written a number of books, other books about um, the Romanovs in Russian history. And some people, including myself, kind of have issue with certain of, you know, their like writing style and their research methods, but like most of what they write is, you know, pretty spot on, despite, you know, they do get things wrong or a little biased sometimes, but the book they wrote it was so, so good. I would highly recommend it. And I can't wait to do the video based on these posts I wrote about this book. And um, if you're wondering, um, Romanov is the proper Russian pronunciation. I know many um, English speaking people say um, Romanov, but that's actually not correct. No, no, that makes me sound like a pretentious little twit, but 
I don't care. And so anyway, here are some other books I recently got from the library. Maybe I can get through this month. Um, the Carnival of Ash by Tom Becker Legge. Becker Legge. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. It's about, I believe it's like set in on Renaissance or medieval Italy. And it just looks like a really, really interesting book. Um, Carla Mazzone, a young wordsmith arrives at the city gates intent on making his name as the bells ring out with the news of the death of the city's poet leader. Instead, he finds himself embroiled with the intrigues of a city in turmoil, the looming prospect of war with their rival Venice ever present, a war that threatens not only to destroy Cadenza, but remove it from history altogether. And he's living in the printing quarter of this city. I'm sorry, some of the synopsis I'm covered by obnoxious tape in the beginning of the flyleaf for whatever this is called so I'm very sorry I can't like read the entire synopsis and I saw this on display they've been doing you know like biographies from A to Z over the last year in the library in the nonfiction section the girl who fought the great depression about Shirley Temple now I'm not really wild about most child actors and I'm not really familiar with um, Miss Temple's body of work I've seen a few of her like, films over the years and I have seen a couple of her adult roles. I mean, she didn't like super, super impress me, but she didn't like annoy me. Like, for example, the one child actor or just like actor overall, the like classic Hollywooder, I cannot stand as Mickey Rooney. I just hate that dude. He was so freaking annoying. But, you know, Shirley Temple, she's, I mean, all right. She doesn't like annoy me a lot. But anyway, I just thought this would be a really interesting book to read because she was obviously, you know, a very important child actor and child star and helped a lot of people through the Great Depression. My um paternal grandma, may she rest in peace, had like wonderful, wonderful Memories of going to see Shirley Temple's at Shirley Temple at the movies like her. She went to like a, a Catholic school, and like I guess when they were good or like at the end of a week or something, or just you know to celebrate. Like the nuns would like you know take them out to town and they would go to the movies and watch Shirley Temple movies. And so that would be you know a really fun memory she had. Maybe I can feel close to her when I'm reading this book. And this is a graphic novel I saw on display for um Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, which was obviously last month in May or maybe it was April I think but I'm anyway it was sometime in the spring and I still have this book out the best we can do by the Bui I'm sorry if I'm mangling the pronunciation of the thing that Vietnamese immigrants you know how they came to the U.S. after the Vietnam War and they like we you know really struggled to make ends meet and fit into their new society and I'm sorry if this angle is really bad I really don't have much control over where I can and cannot Film. And so anyway, here are, there's a really, really big coffee table book under these ones. I'm going to show it to you guys and hopefully it will, you know, see, you will see it all on the total screen. This is about octopi. I saw this on display. Also, it was a special display in the library in the nonfiction section about, you know, wildlife and including octopi because they have just been declared sentient beings in the UK, which is really, really wonderful. I absolutely Love marine life. Um, at the end of my days, God willing, I will be buried at sea because, you know, it just totally speaks to my soul. But according to Jewish law, you have to have, you know, dirt over your coffin. So maybe I'll kind of get around that prohibition by, you know, being buried at sea in a sack with some dirt in it. And so this is like really, really beautiful pictures in it. I can't wait to start looking through it all. It's like really, really heavy, but I absolutely love, you know, animal photography and good coffee table books and just, you know, marine life, and I am very sorry if I'm rambling. This video is completely unscripted. And anyway, for channel content, in addition to doing the video comparing and contrasting the books about um, Anastasia and the woman who um, falsely claimed for 60 years to be her, Anna Anderson, who was um, born Franziska Shanskowska, I will also be doing some tag videos I still have to catch up with. If you tag me in the last couple of months, please don't think I've been ignoring you guys. I've just, you know, had other things I've been focusing on doing. And also, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention for the Ancient Tathon because I don't have a copy yet to hold up. I'm also hoping to read the Heptameron by Queen Marguerite de Navarre of France. Like some people believe it was actually, you know, written by a man or something and not, oh, God forbid, a woman actually wrote a book in the Renaissance. But, you know, I do tend to believe she really did write the book. I mean, not that like, you know, someone else just writing it and putting her name to it. It's kind of like really sex to say a woman couldn't really have written a book. It's based on the Decameron, obviously, only she has like 70 stories, although I've heard it's actually 72, not 70. That's why you know, the word um, heptameron means like a story of, you know, 70 stories, and it's like a very similar premise, only in the her brigata has um, also 10 people, but they're um, five men and five women, and they're taking shelter at like because of a, a flood. It's like, I believe it's like a convent or a monastery. I'm sorry, I've not read the book. I've just, you know, looked over the synopsis and stuff, but I'm really looking forward to reading that book because it's something I've really wanted to read 
for many, many years. And I did announce plans to read this book last month. There was a readathon by um, four um, ladies on BookTube, Dr. Zhivago, which would was a reread for me. I read a couple of chapters, but I was like more focused on the other things I was doing, particularly my um, first ever buddy read, um, The Betrothed by Alessandro Manzoni, which I absolutely loved. It was a gripping page turner, but I really wasn't like that compelled by this book. I guess this translation made it seem even less appealing than before, and I was really surprised all four of the ladies reading the, I mean, sorry, leading the readathon D and F'd it. Like some of them gave up sooner than others, but I don't even think like one of them got even midway through the book, so that was really surprising. But anyway, I would like to continue giving it a shot and like, you know, looking through more of the book. Maybe I'll get more into it during the month as I'm, you know, rereading it. But anyway, I'm saying like so many times I'm have nothing against Boris Leonidovich Pasternak as a person. I absolutely love him both as a like, human being and a poet, but it's so obvious he was not a novelist first and foremost. He was a poet and there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just like a lot of things about his writing style that make it obvious he was not familiar with how you write a novel properly at all. And so anyway, hopefully I will be able to get back to this and I'm um, finished rereading it in a different translation, but I don't think it'll ever become, you know, one of my absolute favorite books. It's just, you know, for many reasons, I have lots of different issues with it. And I would also like to take part in a readathon hosted by A.J. Dunn Reads and Writes. Um, they're going to be reading together as a group on um, the Diary of Anne Frank, which I have surprisingly never read at all. I've read like excerpts of it in anthologies of journals, both like women's journals and like journals of like teenagers who perished in the show but I've never like read it full from cover to cover I don't know why that is because you know it's one of my areas of expertise and I a lot of my own historical fiction is about the Shoah including um Shoah survivors after the war not just like during and immediately after I, I had so many books of Shoah memoirs on my shelf if you saw one of my previous videos where I was doing you know got a shot of all the books I had before they unfortunately almost all went into storage 900 miles away but hopefully I would you know like to take part in that and finally read this book and I have, you know, many thoughts about it. Like, unfortunately, many people have pointed out correctly the only reason, you know, many people have, like, heard about Anne Frank is because she unfortunately passed away if she had survived and written about her experiences in the camp after she met people who were not really good at heart at all. Like, they might have rejected it because, you know, it took so many decades for people to start actually, you know, like, publishing and taking seriously and liking, not, I mean, sorry, that's a very, very choice of word, but, you know, like, appreciating and understanding and welcoming like memoirs and novels and stuff other book kinds of books about the show because you know it just like painted a picture people weren't ready to admit for many reasons I know I'm kind of really really getting off topic about this but I guess maybe I can discuss that in some future videos but anyway I know this is a very important book of the show and it's something I should very much like to read hopefully I will be able to get part and take part in that readathon and also for my writing this is I'm um, Juno Rimo it's, just, it's not like affiliated with NaNoWriMo at all. It's basically kind of like an honor system. You fill in the spreadsheet with your daily word counts and keep track of them. But I'm planning to continue with um, the Radical Rewrite, which was on hiatus for a long time of the book formerly known as The Very Last. It's the third of the books in my Atlantic, Atlantic City prequel series. It's set over the course of 1940. And this is the little book I do, did my um, notes for, you know, the chapter by chapter of the third book, The Very Last and the fourth book, which um, working title is still almost as an afterthought, the first six months of 1941. And there's also notes in addition to like different things about like the story and like, you know, like buildings, I'm sorry, in the plaza that's based on Stuyvesant Plaza in Albany, New York, and just like things to help me as I'm going through the book. And so hopefully I will be able to finally finish this um, radical re -rate, rewrite already by the end of the year and then like, you know, go through it and polish it up and finally have it ready for um, printing. I'm an indie author if you aren't already aware of it. So thank you very much for listening. I do apologize again very, very much for the horrible, horrible lighting in this video, but please um, consider liking and subscribing, sharing, and commenting if you haven't already. I really do appreciate seeing comments from all of my viewers, like new as well as old, and just, you know, getting to know who my audience is, making virtual friends with these guys. And so see you again very soon. Thanks. Bye.